internet. We have Kevin Johnson with us, you know him by now. A former Free to Battalion non-commissioned officer, former policeman. Even his company commander said he was a legend, and that I believe. But now we need to talk about something which is very serious, because once you leave an army, uh, you need to generate an income. There used to be a time, you know, when you joined your dad's firm, or you got a job somewhere, and you worked yourself up through the ranks. Well, we know in the last 20, 25 years in South Africa, that's not a possibility. But given you're a man who's now based in London, and you have ideas on this subject of entrepreneurship and how to run your own business and how to start something. And we know that the time is coming. We will, we, we will have to be able to take care of ourselves. So over to you. Thank you for being here. Explain to us how we need to do this. Well, I suppose the best way for me to uh, explain it is just to give you, you know, the journey that I've gone over the last 30 odd years after I left 3 to Battalion on the 31st of December, 1983. So basically, uh, we, we're now into 1984, and I'm taking a month or two out to relax. i would met a lady the year before. That accelerated very quickly. So we were being, I think it was around about February, we were looking for a place to stay together, and I started to look around. So anyhow, I was introduced to some people, and they spoke to me about this asset finance. And I was quite intrigued by it. It seemed to pay well. It's something that I thought I could enjoy, so on and so forth. And I must share a story with you. I went for an interview at this Barclays Asset Finance in South Africa. It's known as West Bank. Uh, it is the biggest financier of vehicles. Um, in South Africa. So I go for this interview, probably about two weeks before Easter, and uh, I'm getting interviewed there, and the guy says, yeah, you know, you don't have to worry too much. You might only have to go out like one or two evenings a week. And I'm thinking to myself, well, well the bit of research I've done about them is that they get all their finance from car dealerships. And obviously car dealerships are not open in the evening. So I was a little bit confused. And obviously, the guy's playing up the job. You know, you get a brand new car. And once you've been there three years, you get a big subsidy towards your mortgage, et cetera, et cetera. And then I thought to myself, no, hold on. I better stop this guy quickly to make sure we're on the right track. Because I wanted the marketing job where you call on dealers. And then he explained to me, oh, no, no, with your background, you would be very, very suited to actually repossessing vehicles. Totally different animal, but Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I don't want to be rude there because I was obviously quite excited about joining this organization. But in my mind, I was saying, well, God, I would have then just stayed in the police if I wanted that bit of fun. So, anyhow, we, I explained to him that it was really the marketing. He goes, oh, okay, that's the case. We then got to move you up to the next floor. And there you can actually be interviewed by the head of marketing. So the one thing I must say about the um, interviewing, even though it was like back then in the 80s, is that there was some sort of psychometric testing. There were some very decent questions asked about why I wanted to go into marketing. And to be honest with you, uh, the branch that I was going to work in, which was probably about the fifth biggest branch in South Africa, they had about 50 or 60 branches. You know, I had to see the actual branch manager. So in my mind, I was going to see the company commander. And then when he was finished, the actual manager that I was going to work under, he interviewed me as well. So, you know, like I've always said, of course, in my previous videos, I work on those four questions. You know, what should I be doing? What shouldn't I be doing? And then also what's working and what's not working? And obviously, in the entrepreneurial world, you mustn't just restrict it to you. You've got to also look 
in the framework of, you know, the company you're working in. So if I had to compare it, what I saw there was something that excited me, which was, oh, I'm going to take that form of recruiting, obviously fine-tune it, and that's how I will recruit people when they come ultimately to work in my company. Whereas in the military, I thought in some ways they got it horribly wrong. So the police, I must say, their recruitment was very systematical there. You saw senior people. You got a one-on-one -on -one interview. Now, if we look at the infantry school, you know, you could perhaps put aside and say, well, you know, there's so many national service people that are coming in to be leaders and that either a corporal or a lieutenant, that you perhaps couldn't do it with them. But I felt at the infantry school that, they had the decency and there must have been strategic and tactical reasons why they put all the teachers like Buttons, et cetera, into Bravo Company and separated them from the younger people. Now, bear in mind, at, at, at infantry school, everyone that comes in there has matric. Okay, so there's a certain level there, really. the bar's been set. But the Bravo company there were all the teachers and that, and they kept them all as a group and never, you know, spread them amongst all the other companies that were in the far, the majority. However, I think they could have shown a little bit more decency, that's the army, to those who had joined voluntary that were actually permanent force members. So what they did there if they had the 70 or 80 or whatever it is, 90 of us that were at the infantry school in that year that were actually permanent force, they had us all displaced amongst all the companies. So basically, you had, like in my platoon, and I don't think my platoon was a abnormal platoon. Uh, in my platoon, let's say there were three or four permanent force guys, is that when it came to around about, I don't know, September, October, and they decided what you're going to be, whether you're going to be an NCO or whether you're going to be a, 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 a lieutenant, it was actually left to three people that were all national service deciding the future of a permanent force member. And not only were they national service, the two of the three that were working my platoon had been troops the previous year. So to me, that was a little bit of a fast. It didn't bother me because the pay was exactly the same. So I was off to the border, going to get my danger pay. So it made no difference what I ended up actually being, and I was going to go there for only three years. But there were others that were obviously very upset. Also... You know, if you look at, for example, the 3 2 battalion as an example, you know, in the recruiting, the, 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 um, they're all volunteers that wanted to go to 3 2 battalion. You know, I could never get my head around why a great unit like that would expose themselves to so many new people every year by allowing them to come there for one year. So in my case, for example, you know, I was a little bit like the SP in that I was always giving, giving, giving and learning very little because every year I had a new lieutenant. So, so it was very exciting for me um, at, sorry about this, I almost slipped off my chair there. Give me one sec. So I was very excited about joining this organization because I noticed that you start at the bottom and you grow and some people obviously progress further through the ranks for want of a better word and that you know with interviewing they don't play around there's some very senior people that are actually interviewing you so that was you know I was always mindful in my time at the army to say, what do I see here that's working, what's not working, so that one day when I got my own business, I can take best practices over and be mindful of what I must actually avoid. So that was then the start. So basically, 
Uh, at West Bank, they call them branches. But just to compare my time in the company of Charlie Company, I'm going to call this branch a company as well. So it's quite interesting because when I joined, it actually had a company commander. He had four managers under him, and they all ran sections in the actual uh, company. The one was support, which was admin, and the other three divisions were actually full-on marketing. So what actually happened is I got put into the one marketing team. What was also interesting is that what it, were, it was similar to a sort of three-two battalion, which was you know four platoons in a company. Um, this this particular company. Um, had 32 staff members. I'll never forget that. Um, the lady that was having to do a head count for the security in the building, because it was quite a high rise in building. And she said, I've got to take all the names down of all the staff and that. And uh, she said to the guy, he was standing there at a the desk, oh yeah, there's 32 people that work at this branch. And I just chuckled because I mean, that was like quite incredible. So uh, that's how I basically commenced my career in the business world. Uh, the one other thing that I must also say that I observed straight away there, and I must say I preferred the three-two way. And I went, huh, later on when I have a little bit more of a senior position, I'm going to introduce the three-two way. And that is, at three-two, we had a company commander. In this branch, we had a company commander. He was the branch manager. Now, this branch manager had a fantastic office that you could overlook and see the docks and the sea. He had a big desk in his office with two chairs in front of it. And he had a little mini boardroom table with four chairs. He had a door to this office and was closed quite a lot. And outside the office, he had a gatekeeper, namely the secretary. And when I looked at this lot, I discovered also into the future that he never used to go on to the front line that often. In other words, into the dealerships where we go and get the business, because that was really what uh, our banking was all about. You know, ours wasn't a bank where you had clients and that come into the branch. There was no branch. We were up on the 11th floor. And I said to myself, wow, he surrounded himself with all of this. It's no wonder he doesn't go up that often. And I said to myself, okay, uh, that's what I shouldn't be doing one day when I get into a more senior position. So quite frankly, I preferred the company commander's method at C2 Battalion. He had a bed. If you went into his office, you either sat on his bed or you sat on his trauma. Versus what I saw there in the first days when I commenced. So to me, that was like, uh -uh, you're never going to do that, Kev. And I suppose he was closer to his men as well. At three two, because he would accompany me. Absolutely. So on money day, which was getting out there into the dealerships, because one thing I liked about the job, you had a target, a production target of X rands per month, and you, all your names were up on the board in the main area of the branch. Everyone could see it. Okay, and the difference was that the the branch manager there wouldn't. Uh, go out like Tierners on money days, meaning into Angola to do the job that you were paid to do. So and I always say to myself in my mind, well, Kev, there's no ways that you're going to do it like what you've seen now. You're going to do it the way, you know, Sam Tierners and Tom and them did it. Any questions, um, Chris? No, I'm utterly fascinated here. Right. So what did the job actually entail? Well, it was very simple. You get given a briefcase 
or you go buy a briefcase, you get a brand new car because obviously you call in on car dealerships. And what you basically do is you call on dealers. So the men, that's the business development officers was in the one section, all men except for a very older woman who came originally from Trust Bank because Trust Bank was a big player in the 70s. She was a business development officer there. So if she was the only woman in this men's team, yeah? Then the other team was a group of men and women that looked after a big dealer group. And then there was the third team, which was women that were sitting on big dealer floors. So that was basically how we hit the market out there. So... <clears throat> I was a business development officer, as I said, on the road, uh, get given a brand new car. Obviously, you've got to wear collar and tie, but not suits. Okay. And obviously, um, there were no safari suits around. <laughs> and basically, what you would do is you'd wake up in the morning and you'd get out onto the road and call on these dealerships and... Uh, sell your company being West Bank's financial services. And that obviously the dealers are all familiar with it. And it's all about building up relationships and getting uh, the dealers to support you. The one thing I, I realized very quickly is that I wasn't going to make the mistake that I saw a lot of my colleagues making in the bank where they were used to complain a lot about Things like, yeah, West Bank is too strict, and so we're not picking up enough finance from the dealerships. My attitude was, that's the credit standards the bank set. All I've got to do is make sure that I'm in the top three positions on that board. There was nothing, nothing else that was coming into my world in work other than being in the top three. So what I immediately did is I observed how these marketing people and the people internally as well, how they handle their week. And what I noticed is that Saturday and Sundays, except for the girls on the floors who would work alternative Saturdays, but all the men on the road, they would work Monday to Friday even though the dealers were open on Saturdays. They would work from 8 o'clock in the morning till half 4, 5 o'clock in the evening, even though the dealers were open till 6, 7, 8 o'clock in the evening. And I decided to take my model from 3 to battalion. So basically to recap what that actually means, and of course we maybe we can just slow down Okay, this part, and if you've got any questions, I can explain it a little bit more because I think it's important that, you know, the people listening do get it, is that the first, the first type of day that you get is a rest day. So you always start with making sure you really energized, refreshed, rejuvenated, okay, and then you go and play at work. Because too many people in life work their backsides off and in, in the last couple of days, they still were working and they exhausted and that. And then eventually they have to force themselves to rest. I think that's a stupid way of working. <clears throat> um, you've got to always try and work in a way where, you know, you're fully optimized and make sure you get en enough rest days. So what I decided as a young man then was that, I was going to start off in that junior position and say, look, you know, Sundays would be my rest day. For me, you had to have a rest day, number one. <clears throat> number two, dealers were closed on Sundays. And number three, it's for religious reasons. And I always said to myself, you know, what would I have done if the dealerships were open on Sunday? Well, I would have worked around that because my religion comes before my work. So that actually suited me down to the ground. So then I had six days over 
And then what I decided to do is that because the dealers used to be busy on the weekend, they would be tying up a lot of things on the Monday. So therefore, I discovered that on Tuesdays, that's the slowest time for sales. So what I did is I then took my second type of day, which is a preparation day. And I used Tuesday as the preparation day. And then Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday were my money day. So straight away, that gave me an advantage over the competitors because I was on those dealership floors on Saturdays. So they were hoping to pick up some business the Monday morning. I'd already worked the floors on the Saturday. What I also did with that rest, I call it a rest day, a buffer day, and a focus day or a money-making day. What I also did for about two years, because for two years I was a business development officer, what I also used to do is when I used to target dealerships where I wasn't getting much business, I would go home, and then what I would do is I would chill out a little bit at home. Uh, if it was summer, I would swim. Then I would shower. And then what I'd do is I'd get dressed again and then go back to those dealerships. Just after the opposition had actually left. So that then enabled me, and these were dealers where we weren't necessarily getting support. That would then enable me, you know, to get some sort of in there. Because all I would do is I would just go there at, let's say, half past five or whatever it is, park off, and then tell the guys I'm available because I'm sitting there at the desk. And then I would do my admin and that. So it wasn't really time wasted. But, you know, maybe for the first week or so, the guys are well into supporting someone else. So you might not see much business, but then eventually, you know, the guys just feel like, gosh, you know, he's here to help us. And that's when you start to get a deal or two. And then the game's on to take business away uh, from the competitors. So, Breaking notes as you speak here. Yeah, yeah. So do you, do you have any questions on that? It seems to me that you were doing was the intelligence assessment. Uh, yes. Very much the same as you would have done in the army. Yes. And you found the weaknesses and you exploited them. But there's nothing wrong with exploitation. I mean, I know it's a bad word, but in this instance, it was for your own good. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. So you need to know your business and you need to know your clients. Yes. Uh, do you also need to know your opposition? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, in that particular example, is that, you know, that was a particular dealership that was important to that opposition of mine. And what I knew, is he was getting a lot of business there. But what I did know is that around about quarter to five, he would be leaving. But the world of the dealership still continues after quarter to five. So yeah, you know, what more. you got to do, you've got to take some rest time whilst he is in there because he's the incumbent, you know, he's the preferred lender at the moment, and then come up with tactics that's going to give you a chance. So what is your end goal then? Would your end goal be just to make money? Or is it more than that? You need money to do certain things. It's a lifestyle. But what are you pursuing? Well, well, in that example, um, it was very specific, is that you had to be three years in the bank. Because in those days, you know, interest rates, were running at 17, 18, 19, 20 odd percent. So a mortgage or a bond, as they say in South Africa, that rate is just huge. But if you are 
a business development officer, three years, okay, they give you a housing subsidy, meaning a low interest rate of 2.5%. Now, in that period of that two years that I was working there, the first two years, I'd got married, baby on the way, et cetera. So what you're now looking at is you're wanting a, your own home. So there's two ways of getting this low interest rate. You either wait out your three years or you get promoted to senior BDO. And so the minute you get to senior BDO, that means you don't have to wait three years. So basically, the only way that I can get to senior BDO above the rest is if I excel. And the most important way to excel is to actually have high production. Because obviously, being in finance in those days, you get no commission. So your package still stays the same. It's just that the promotions can come earlier. So basically what happened, we were about, of all the business development officers and the finance center consultants that sit on the floors, let's say there was about 16 of us. There's only one position for senior BDO. There's obviously three managers above them, but in terms of business development officers, there's only one senior business. And that basically was a specialization in Mercedes-Benz finance. So what actually happened is I got this phone call from uh, this manager of mine, and he was a real, uh, I don't even, if you can remember, there was a Afrikaans banker in South Africa, Yannis Marais. Yes, of course. Very famous, man. Yeah, he started Trust Bank. So, you know, I met him once or twice, and he was always impeccably dressed. I mean, came to work, suit, waistcoat, everything, handkerchief. Now, my manager, my first manager, he had worked for Yannis Marais. Afrikaans guy, a thorough gentleman. I mean, his command of the English and Afrikaans language was incredible. So his secretary phoned us one day and said, he'd like to see me. Now, I had heard that this guy that had the senior BDO's position was being transferred to the corporate division. So I went, whew, this could be it. But when I got there, I noticed that there was someone else there waiting to see him. And I thought to myself, if, if it wasn't me getting it, it would be this guy. So this didn't make sense to me. So yeah, we both got called in there and he said, I want to congratulate you. You know, we've decided now to have two senior BDOs in the branch. The one is going to look after Mercedes, which went to the other guy, and I was going to work on a new project. I want to say a new project, not a theoretical project. <laughs> the project meant you had to bring in business. And uh, so I was very happy. So in, just to answer your question there, what it then, then meant is that the, the minute I actually left his office, it was going to be more pay, uh, then all of a sudden now you're, you're quite, because they're very like status orientated there with cars, because you know, their, their business is calling on car dealerships. So then a better a car, company car. And then obviously uh, the most important thing is you now get the two and a half percent mortgage. So it then- It is clever, but it can also tie you in. Yes, yes, very it can much be so. a burden. Oh, absolutely. We'll talk about that. Yes, yes. So I would say the one thing I took from the army to get to there, where I've just mentioned to you, is basically the rest, uh, that buffer day, where you can get all your admin and everything done, and then the money-making day. So those three categories, uh, 
were very important to me. And I tried not to mix the three. So someone once said to me, what is a proper rest day? I said, well, a proper rest day is from midnight to midnight, not two half days, from midnight to midnight. So if you send one email off, you take one phone call from business, you take one file out of your work to look at it, that is not a rest day. Now, it's not easy, but you start with those rules in place, and then eventually you're starting to get proper rest days. And also, you know, when you take the rest days away, that means you've got six days left. And then if you take your buffer day away, it means you've got five days left. And that's actually just telling you psychologically, you've got to get serious in the other five days. But there is a difference, Kev, between working smart and working hard. Absolutely. Can you explain to us the difference? Because, I mean, soldiers and, and people are not lazy people, really. They're not lazy people. But sometimes it seems you work yourself to death for nothing. There's still not money at the end of a month. Well, you know, there's many ways in which... Um, People get themselves into that trap. And, you know, I've got eight mindsets which we're going to start sharing in the next video. And one of them is um, freedom through time. And there's a host of reasons why people get themselves onto the treadmill. Um, and one of the reasons why they get themselves onto the treadmill and work themselves into the ground is that, you know, they're doing too many things that's in the comfort zone. And if you don't break out and be courageous and take your business from a lower level of productivity to a higher level, you're going to find uh, eventually that you're going to run out of time in you know, the day that the God gives you. So uh, what I'd like to do is just to sort of keep that for, uh, as I said, these eight mindsets. And the one is freedom through time and then we can really go into it in a deep way which allow the audience then to identify which part relates to them because it can be a host of reasons i think perhaps we should explain to the people watching you that this will be a series yes and absolutely it will also be at one at some stage it's going to be a live uh, type of uh, program Yes. Where people will be able to ask you questions. Ask questions directly. while we're talking like this. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So the game's now on. So I'm working on this project. And as I said to you, I'm not changing much other than sticking to those three days of operating. But then I go on a course up to Johannesburg. And my manager of that division, he goes as well, but he's on a more senior course. And there's a woman on my course that said, oh, what branch are you from? I said, oh, I'm from Cape Town. She said, yes, my boss is going to be your new manager. She was in Springs. So uh, that evening I tell my boss and he goes, I knew it. I knew it. I said, what do you mean you knew it? His name was Dirk Potter. He said, I knew, I found out last week that he's going to be joining my branch. He said, well, that's me. He said, I'll be gone before he comes to start at our branch. I thought, oh, that's, that's very nice. Because <laughs> being in mind, I was just like a 3-2, never planning to make a career there at uh, the bank. So therefore, I could channelize all my energy in just getting my production right and learning skills that I could use in my own business one day. Whereas, you know, these guys that have been a long time or the girls a long time in the bank, they get involved in a lot of politics and things like that. So anyhow, I must have been about four months into that project and the new man arrives. And obviously it gets through the grapevine that he's now there at the branch. He's just arrived. Obviously, the old manager's still there, and it's a Friday. So I'm out there doing my bits at the dealership, and I make my way back to the branch, and I get back there at about 10 past five. 
No one's there. It's up on the 11th floor. No one's there. And um, this manager's door is closed. So it means there's people in there. So I go sit at my desk and um, the door opens. And my manager comes out. Then a manager of another division comes out. And then this new manager walks out. And my manager says to him something about, okay, so I'll see you then on Monday and I'll start taking you to the bigger dealerships. And the new manager turns around and says, no, that won't be necessary. I'll go myself. I go, oh, this is an interesting guy because my manager has already left the branch. He's no longer there. This is an interesting way which this dialogue's going down. And he turns around and he looks at me. And I'll never forget this. The first thing that went through my mind is he looked like, for those people that were in the army in the 80s and went to the infantry school, or were perhaps at 6-1 recognized, RSM, Archia Smut. It could have been his double. Same bold everything, say, but English speaking. So he comes up to me and I introduce, I stand up, I introduce myself, all of that. And straight away he says to me, oh, oh yeah, you, you were in the army for an extended period. I said, yep, that's correct. He said, well, I just want to let you know, he said, I was the RSM. Now, I don't know if it's citizen force or commanders, because in 1984, oh, let me just click my, he, he had been in Queenstown and got transferred to Springs in about 1978. So he was, a, according to him, an RSM already in 78, 77, wherever it is. But, you know, in the time when I met him in the previous five years, obviously he wasn't because he had, then he had been transferred up in his job to Springs. So I don't know if he was commander or whether he was citizen force. And quite frankly, you know, he never brought it up again. He never showed me photos. So you know, I just left it at that. But he had said to me he was the RSM. But he looked like Archie Smith. So there we go. So anyhow, so the three of us are now standing there. This is now the manager of this other division of marketing, the guy that looks after all the girls on the floor. And uh, the new manager says to him, do we have cold beers in the bar? Because obviously we had a big bar on the premises. So the guy says, well, go have a look. So off he goes. And I see him looking up at the board and all the numbers and that. And this other chap comes back and he says, oh, no, no, we don't have beers. So he turns around and says, well, I suggest you phone our bottle store. Just like assuming straight away we've got a bottle store. Uh, could you phone the bottle store and get a cold case of beers, Castle? So goes and makes the phone call and the three of us standing there and he says to the manager of the other division uh, oh sorry the other the other guy from the division says to him I'm sorry I can only have one or two beers because I've got to go it's my wife's birthday tonight so he just turns around straight looks the guy in the eye and says well I hope that doesn't ha happen too often during the week <laughs> then I knew, then I knew this is a guy that parties. This yeah. is going to be a lot of entertainment. I mean, West Bank was known for entertaining, but this guy, he apparently used to party big time. So we go now to the pub. The case arrives. Case gets put in the fridge. And David is on his, finishing his second beer now because he's got to leave. I'm on my second beer. So I've never been a big drinker. And the manager's already finishing his third beer. And so that's one, two, five, six. That's seven beers, and Dave now departs. So now we sit in there. So now it's 17 beers in the fridge. Well, 
him and I, we didn't sit because one thing I came to realize, the guy doesn't sit much. He just stands all the time. Stood there by the pub and finished the case. And I'll tell you something now, on that 17 beers, I must have had six. He put the rest back. Then I realized this is game on. This has been a major shakeup to the branch. In actual fact, he was coming down to start shaking up the largest branch. And then the rumor was he'd become the boss of the whole region and then shake the other seven or eight branches. So then it was game on. I have to wonder how many times that night you ran to the toilet. Yeah, I can't remember. All I do know is that I had to make some phone calls home, and I'll be honest with you, I'm just going to play the game. You know. And, and the reason why I went in... Yeah, and the reason why I went in there that Friday night is because I didn't want to sit in suspense over the weekend thinking, oh, you know, God, what type of guy is this? Has he got plans to replace a lot of us? And I might as well just front up straight away. And that's something that's, you know, a tip for entrepreneurialism is sometimes you just got to front up as quick as possible. Otherwise, there's unnecessary worry and unnecessary stress. It's an interesting thing in law as well, Kev, at the Nuremberg trials. Of course, they had a totally different legal system than what the Germans were used to. Yes. And so they quickly discovered that it would be better to admit the crimes, the worst crimes, right in the beginning, and then carry on hoping that two, three weeks later, these people have now forgotten about it. And so, yes. so we used that technique. Didn't help me, but, but that yes. was what they were thinking. Yes. So anyhow, so obviously things started to change dramatically. The admin manager, she got replaced. Uh, my boss had left immediately. So, you know, there were only two faces of the four managers under him still there. And there must have been about maybe four or five months after he arrived there. So then his secretary phoned me one day and said, could you meet him? He had this favorite steakhouse that he used to go to could, could, near the Newlands rugby ground. Could I meet him there at quarter to one Friday? So of course, off I go. And he loved his beers. So we sit down there in the steakhouse. And he's one of those guys that even though he hasn't been in town a long time, everyone knows him and he knows everyone. So, you know, when he makes an appearance in the room, you know he's arrived. And um, so we sit in there, and I think, yeah, we must, he, we ordered beers. Then he ordered a bottle of uh, red Niederberg Cabernet. And then the, the, the waitress came and he said, no, 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 I, I want to have a chat to Kevin. Yeah, give us a half an hour. Well, I thought, oh, this is interesting. So he says to me, what do you want to do in this bank? I go, well, you know, I'm reaching a stage now. So where I would like to, to uh, manage people, but I want to manage people on the front line where we chase in production, you know, not some back sort of support thing. He goes, oh, that's interesting. He said, well, he said, and then he mentioned this other manager was still there that was looking after this dealer group with about six or seven staff, men and women. He said, well, you know, this guy, uh, he's going to be transferred to corporate as well. So I've got a vacancy. Do you want it? Well, <laughs> I mean, managerial status, a better car, a better salary, having our people to report to you so you can learn those skills now in the business world. It was a no-brainer. So I took it. So then we proceeded to have a steak. Uh, he wasn't a guy for sweets. And then afterwards, he ordered another bottle. And then 
It must have been about maybe quarter past two. So I thought, okay, that's about it. And then he looks at me and he says to me, oh, Kev, um, I've got to be out here at half past four. <laughs> <laughs> So needless to say, the devil. He, <laughs> yeah, need, needless to say, he ordered a bottle of some buka and the beans arrived, and now we sat in there and st he stood, stood up because now we were in a go, and he shook my head and he said, uh, just do what you have to do. I believe in you, I will support you. There's going to be quite a few uh, people that's Noses are going to be out of joint because of how quick you've accelerated in the bank. He said, but you've probably packed this up already. You know, I've got people at head office that are batting on my side. So all you need to do is just go off then. Don't, don't disappoint me. So that was then the first time that I started to look after people. And then I went down into, because this was a high-rise building, and on the third and fourth floor were the, was the car park. And there was another business development officer there, Quirce Simon. So I checked his car there, and I said to him, hey, Quirce, what's that on your back seat? And he goes, oh, no, no, he says, that's a computer. Now, bear in mind, that's like in 1984. So it's these big box computers, a CPU, Okay, the bloody screen itself was huge and it was like a dot matrix printer. So this is quite a bit of kit. And I said to him, well, why is it on your, uh, your back seat? Why don't you bring it up to, your, 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 to the office? He said, no, I had it up there about two months ago. And the, the other boss said, you can't have it there in the office for security reasons. I said, well, I'll tell you what, you bring it up and you put it on my desk and I'll just tell them I'm doing a project, you know, like a bank project, and I need all this stuff. It was like a green screen. But what I realized then is that we used to get reports on a Tuesday of how people had been performing up until Friday of the previous week. So basically, when you got hold of the actual report scores, it was a really, you know, last week already. The world has moved on come Tuesday of the following week. So what I basically did is, and I must say, this influenced me a little bit from my time in 3-2, where I thought of myself sometimes, I wonder, especially not those big opses, but the the, the ones where it was just sort of counting surgeons and walking an area flat. And I know that Yannick Aldenais used to say that you've got to also do that to stop them coming through. But I really used to ask myself sometimes, especially when Falcon wasn't around, I wonder, I wonder how much effort's really gone into this deployment. Because being in mind, you had no control. You were just told that's the area you're going to. So I thought to myself, I wonder to what extent they had the intelligence and the data and everything versus, yep, it's that time of the year. There's no big opses, so we'll just get them to dominate an area and whether we could have perhaps been more effective with, you know, more intelligence. So I said to myself, well, let me see whether I can play a little trick here with this computer, not having a clue how to switch it on, not knowing how to use it, because those computers in those days weren't counterintuitive. So basically what I did is I, I got him to do the work for me. And then what I discovered, it was as simple as this. The eight staff that I had now looking for production, I would just phone them and they knew what data I wanted from them. And they would basically just read it out to me on the phone. And I would then fill it in on an A4 sheet landscape and then give it to him and type it up. And all of a sudden, I had a real-time report after lunch on Friday, which meant I could then coach, guide, etc. What I also then learned in that whole exercise, and someone 
explained this to me, that there's a thing called Pearson's Law. Now, Pearson's Law says that if you take something and you measure it, it improves for you. If you take that, that you're measuring, and you give it to someone else, it can improve exponentially, providing, obviously, you're giving to someone that can guide you, advise you. So that was a, a Pearson's Law dynamic that was going down there. The girls now realize that they had to keep the numbers, whereas previously they were just being told on a Tuesday what they look like. So now they knew they had to keep a register, add up the columns, give it to me on a Friday, and that in itself got them to be more mindful of their performances. And then obviously when it was in my hands, I then knew that I was now in my mind, I was a company commander of these eight people and I was using the bed and trommel method, not the office with a door and a gatekeeper keeping people out. What I also did is I said to them, just like Kiernis had showed us and various other company commanders and we also, that if you don't want to go do this ops, well, then how can you ask others to go and do it? You know, if you're asking people to front up, you must front up as well. So basically what I should say then, what I learned there from 3-2 from was to say to the people out there, if a decision's made that we can't do a deal and you can't look the dealer in the eye, then phone me because I'll tell the dealer. And that went down very, very well with the staff because they then realized that they had someone who was prepared to bat for them especially the girls that were sitting on the floors. You know, you sit on that same floor every day and now you fall out of favor with the dealership because you've said no to a deal. They, you could be like punished for like two days. So, you know, you play that game of good cop and bad cop. And so I found that worked very well because even though I was ex inexperienced and not in the job a long time, I got their sort of trust by showing them that I, I, I'm prepared to front up on their behalf. But the most important thing that came out of that exercise for me was the power of having the data because the data determines who you're going to be speaking to, how you're going to be speaking to them. The data also determines, you know, who are the dealers I need to go and visit, especially, you know, if we get a lot of production and now the production's down and it's been going to a competitor, or, you know, all those things you can just look at uh, by looking at the data rather than perhaps just jumping in your car and going to dealers that are soft dealers where you get welcomed, et cetera. So again, you have to get out of, out of your comfort zone. Yes. And go and do the things which will actually matter. Exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, in the military, that is like not walking a patrol where you know nothing's going to happen. Exactly. You have to go and search. May I will use the word trouble, but that is actually not trouble. It's yes, the deals. You have to go and get those deals. Yep. And get the contract signed. Yeah. So then that was starting to settle down very nicely and the production was really coming in and that. And like all entrepreneurial people, you know, you've got to be on the front foot and you've got to be prepared to stick your neck out, even if you embarrass yourself sometimes. So what I did is I asked him for a meeting. And he said to me, yep, uh, I'm going to get my secretary to get back to you. And um, same old story, it was on a Thursday. He said to me, uh, or she phoned me and said, he'll meet you there at the restaurant. So it was a different restaurant. We get there, we sit down, he orders a beer. He says to me, yes, Kev, so what would you like to speak to me about? And I go, well, I said, you know, 
I've noticed something that this dealer group that I'm looking after, they well d- dispersed in the Cape Town area. So the other manager who looks after the girls on the floor and my dealerships, they're overlapping. I said, I'm out there and I drive past, I go into my dealership, I climb in my car, and then I drive down the road, I pass one of your dealerships. You know, don't you think it would be better? And I'd not conferred with this other guy. I said, don't you think it would be better that you just actually split it into two? So that geographically, you know, we, we got it under control. So he goes, oh, that's an interesting thing. He said, you know, he never discussed that with me. But he said, it's quite interesting that you should be uh, mentioned that. He said, because he's going to be leaving. I go, oh. He said, yeah, yeah, he's decided he's going to get into the motor industry and become a car dealer. You know, go work at a big car dealership firm. To be honest with you, you know, he had not shared that with any of us uh, because he had only told the manager two days ago. So that was, so he said to me, oh, so are you saying you divide the area up into two? So now that I knew that the guy was leaving, I said, no, 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 no. I said, you know, give it to me. I can look after both. So basically, he gave both to me. And then what I realized very quickly that there was something similar to the military in that branch. They had SPs. And the SPs in the Western Cape would be mixed race people. And whilst the bank always fashioned itself on progressing the people, they weren't progressing anywhere near the whites. It was 1984. What I also discovered is that now that I was looking after two of the three marketing teams, that the females on the floors, they had been discriminated against because their job was actually harder than the men that were in cars driving around. Because if you're driving around, of course, looking for business, if you're not getting support from one dealer or not too much, or they don't particularly like you, you can move on. But the poor girls that were sitting on the floors, they couldn't move on. They had to just stay there. And I thought, so wow, this is un- so unfair. But I just been given the job of looking after the tools. So there were no tools I could pull out of my bag to say, oh, I'm going to change that. And also the SPs in the office, they were all office bound. There was nothing much that I could do there, but I thought to myself, if I get another gap of promotion, then I'm going to see whether I can address those two. So in other words, it's almost going against conventional wisdom which is another important thing that you need to do as an entrepreneurial person. When everyone's doing that, look at the opposite direction and say, is there something better? So anyhow, so that whole thing progressed for probably seven or eight months. And then the oldest manager under him was actually going to be transferred to the regional office to be responsible for bigger deals that the branches couldn't approve and that. So they needed his type of expertise. And so obviously we got to hear about it. And so I went straight into to the manager's office and he, I said, him, can I have a chat to you? And um, he said, oh, Do you want Keith's job that's now looking after the men? I said, no, no, no. I want to look after it, all of it, all of it. 
He says, what do you mean? I said, no, no, I reckon I can look after all three teams. So he said, but then we're going to end up with one manager, you, and the support manager, the admin lady, whereas previously I've had four. How do you intend doing it? I said, well, the first question I want to ask you is that if I do come up with a plan and it's an acceptable plan, would you consider it? He said, well... I would certainly look at it. And he was quite a, uh, I wouldn't say egotistical guy, but, you know, he was one of, one of these guys that liked to say, I can do it. I can make the decision. He wasn't one of those managers that say, oh, I'm going to refer this to someone. So basically, I, I put my proposal to him. So being the man that he is, he said, we'll do that at lunch. So off to lunch we went. So I said to him, this is what I've got planned. I said, when I take on that job, and I've got now all of the marketing of the branch, probably about 17 people, I said, what I'm going to do is I said, you know, young Theo, now he's like an SP. I said, I'm going to promote Theo into the marketing team. We just got to do it because there's more and more SPs joining, and they have their own meetings as SPs, mixed race people. They have their own meetings, whether we like it or not, and they talk about things where, you know, just like at 3-2, uh, they train us when we arrive there, but they never get the actual credit or the breaks. Now, they might get the credit, but they don't get the breaks. That was the same thing. It was, believe it or not, going down at Barclays Asset Finance, a bloody international company in South Africa. So it just shows you, you know, how it used to be. And it wasn't just in, you know, very, very for crumped organizations. I mean, Barclays is a proper international firm with head offices here in London. So what did I learn in the army that I implemented there? First of all, with the SP, I could now work on him, if I got permission, to get him ready within six months. And that would send a message out to the other SPs. Two, I said to the manager that in the military, because you were in the military, I said to him, I said, I can only speak of one company that I was in, one unit I was in, and the unfairness of platoon commanders and platoon sergeants. If you're very experienced as a platoon sergeant, you're always the one ending up having to teach. And the one thing I've never bought into, course, never, is that I used to sit with senior NCOs and they always used to make the comments of how they showed up the officer, how they were better than the officer, so on and so forth. And they would even come up with terminology of why it is like it is. And I never bought into that. And whenever I was privy to those conversations, I used to let the NCOs know in no uncertain term that if you, for argument's sake, sitting at 3-2, because that's the only place I know, and you're a platoon sergeant in the third year that you're there, okay, you know Euro, or you're not sophisticated, okay, if you're teaching a young man that's coming in. It goes without saying that you should know more than that person. So that I didn't believe in. First of all, that type of behavior from NCOs, but more important of all, I didn't buy into the army's system. I believed at a unit like 3-2 Battalion, you come in there, you do your orientation, etc., cetera, and uh, no matter who you are, you serve as a platoon sergeant, you learn how to do that job, you gain the respect of your company commander, you gain the respect of the SPs, and then in your next year, you can go and run a platoon. 
So to me, it was also about face. You know, you had some of the more experienced people being NCOs. I mean, someone's experienced, they lead. And this nonsense about, but there's a certain type of attribute that you've got to have as a lieutenant and as a NCO. Well, that might be so in other parts of the army, but not a 3-2 battalion, because 3-2 battalion, it's all about being on the money. You know, similar to an entrepreneurial person. So what I did is, I felt very strongly about it. And I thought to myself, also late in life, I might not have felt that strong if I was an officer, because then I would not have felt it in the same way and experienced it in the same way as an NCO. So basically what I decided to do with this new appointment, I said to, um, to my manager, okay, two of the floor where there's ladies sitting on the floors. I'm going to close those floors for us because there's not much production there. They've got new franchises. The volumes are just not there. And I'm going to put them into two of the bigger floors and I'm taking two of the ladies off the floors. And for the first time in their life now, they're going to get a company car and all the other perks because now they're going to come onto the road. And so that shook up the system a little bit because the men were looking, oh, well, this is sacred to men. This, this is Duck the Boys Club. And so with that appointment, I immediately broke that. And then obviously all the women on the floor that were ambitious now knew, wow, I can get through to being a business development officer. I'm going to get a new company car rather than driving my own car around. They qualify for the low interest rates and their salaries would be bigger. And quite frankly, when they came onto the road, they found the job easier because it, it was always so that the job on the floor was harder. So that was all good things. Um, and then the other thing that uh, I implemented is there were two Afrikaans guys who had been there quite a long time uh, on the road. I took them both off calling on dealers and they became my reckies, meaning... In my own company, just like I felt at 3-2 Battalion, we should have had recce seconded to us. I was not going to depend on collaborating with the corporate branch for big deals. I believed we had a lot of that business floating around in the world we worked in, which was just normal retail. Namely, that where the lady sat on the floor and where our guys called, just picking up normal retail, you know, the private individuals, there was a lot of corporate stuff going down at those dealerships, which our staff never got involved in because they were retail. Plus, in the office, corporates would be phoning in to get settlements on their vehicles. Who was capturing those opportunities? And then also there was data that was telling us, you know, who's got 90 days still to run on the accounts. So I felt there was more than enough business there for two business development officers. So I pulled the two aside. I said, would you like to come off the road calling on dealerships and now work directly with clients? Oh, they were over the moon because I think they had started to get tired about calling on dealers. And then I said three things to them. I said, your production that you write at the moment, add a third onto it right now. So they added a third on each. I said, okay, what's the number? They both gave it to me. I said, okay, I want you to go away because I know how much business is there. I want you to go away and tell me whether that new figure can be achieved every month after three months. Secondly, if you're looking for a detailed job description, the job's not for you. You have to start thinking entrepreneurial. And if you're looking for a job description that describes that department that the two of you are going to create with my help, then you're barking up the wrong tree. Those are the things you're going to come up with and give to me in three months' time. And we were very fortunate, Chris, that when they came on board, okay, they, they had like 
myself, I had a, a desk in the very, very far corner and they came to sit there with me. And they're both Afrikaans boys and they called it Boer Hook. And, and immediately, because obviously most of the staff is English and the dealers are all English, but when you add these two buggers together, boy, oh boy, it was like they were back in um, Afrikaner land. I mean, the one guy, was he had this young English girl, she comes up to him. I mean, I don't think she could speak any word of, and he would, he would say to her things like, yeah, what will you Oh, that was quite humorous to me. And um, he, he was a fantastic guy. And when I first started at the bank, he used to sit in front of me. And one day I couldn't work out some calculations. It was late Friday afternoon. And I had to get the deals paid out. So I said, of course, could you come and help me with these calculations? And he looked me straight in the eye. I get not tight. I can't blast you. Because his, his family had a farm up there in Feltruff. So anyhow, when he came and worked for me, he came to me with a, a deal one afternoon. So he said, Kev, could you have a look at this deal? So I looked at him. I said, him, hey, Chris, you know, Kevin, could I should speak of recordings to him? Uh, he, I said to him, I get not eat, I can't blast you. <laughs> anyhow, we both laughed and went downstairs and we had a beer. So anyhow, so that was cracking. So uh, it was all good things. We got the SP integrated. Uh, we got the ladies for the first time in their life being able to be promoted now. And these two guys were, you know, an absolute star from day one. So, you know, we were up like 15% on total production and we were doing it with, you know, the same amount of staff because we just reallocated the people. And for the branch, instead of having three managers, we're just myself. So that all progressed nicely. I mean, the one thing that did hit me one day was that, you know, we had a wonderful pub there overlooking the bay. So you could see the docks and the sea and everything. And what was funny in that pub, and I said to my boss, I'm going to break this mold, is that the girls on the floor used to sit together. The business development officers men used to stand together. It wasn't because they were talking rugby. It was just almost like a status type of thing. And the poor SPs, they used to sit in their little corner. And I decided I'm actually going to break all of that. Not easy. And one of the reasons why I decided to break it, I felt that it's good for the staff morale. It's getting everyone to be, you know, playing the game together. You know, um, and I suppose the thing that probably made me decide to do that because it was a pub environment and the pubs played a big role at that bank. You know, that pub was used like three times a week. Sometimes 60, 70 dealers would come in there. And I suppose what made me more sensitive and more aware of it is that there was something back at 3-2 Battalion, being an NCO, that I got intellectually, but more important of all, emotionally, was that if you looked at a platoon, we had four pubs. We had a pub for the troops. We had a pub for the SPNCOs, we had a pub for the whites NCOs, and we had a pub for the officers. And I could never see anything intellectual in that decision. Never. But you would be walking with someone and then it would have to be an awkward type of party because you've got to go there for your drink. I'm going to go there for my drink. But just three weeks prior to that, we die for one another. Now, I know maybe back in South Africa, it was important. Maybe it made sense. But my little paradise that I was in 3 two made no sense to me. And I said to myself, I'm not 
going to have that in a pub where I'm becoming a player. And I certainly didn't have it when I opened up my own business. So it just shows you sometimes, you know, you can get it intellectually, but unless you emotionally have felt it, um, sometimes some actions never take place, if that makes sense. Yes, it makes sense because you're trying to get a unit together. Yes. Because the battle outside the army for survival is actually, in my eyes, worse. Yes. The one in the army. The army is quite simple. There's the enemy, find him, kill him, done. And the army will take care of the rest. But out in civilian life, much harder. Much, yes. much harder. Yes. The other thing I want to mention too, you know, that um, if you look at those business development offices, we, which were men, and now I started my career there, and then and the finance center consultant had sat on the floor. They never had company cars. They earned a less of a salary. And I'll tell you something you now. When I sussed out after a couple of months how it all works there, I will always, always uh, remember I thought of the late Nundas Kirsten, my first platoon commander, where he said to me, Kev, I'm not going to be um, in the platoon very long. Um, he said, I'm moving on and I'm going to teach you how to be a platoon commander. And he said, no matter what anyone says, and I think we shared this in a previous video, that the circles of a platoon sergeant and a platoon commander, Act 3 2, actually almost overlaps 100%, except for one or two things. And you know, I'm, I always remembered that. And when I saw at that bank how they separated the two, when in actual fact, you could have almost put the one circle over the other, but it suited the establishment for whatever the reasons are to give the impression and say there's a difference. When in actual fact, Nandis was saying to me, as a permanent force uh, experienced platoon commander, there is no difference. And, you know, he, he, he was a guy that went on and eventually became a lieutenant colonel or a colonel. And in actual fact, he went back to 3 2. So I always, remember that that he said to me and check that out at the bank so you know you found it in in many institutions levels of unfairness but the system used to say that there's good reasons for it and then just lastly what actually happened it just shows you where this luck and timing plays a role also in business time and luck so a long story short this gentleman that was in charge, he was earmarked to become like senior in the region. That didn't start out that quick for him. And I could see he was starting to get a little bit sort of irated. And what I said to him one day, I phoned him one morning and I said to him, oh, could you do me a favor? Could you stay away from work twice a day? Oh, sorry, twice a week. He goes, oh, hold on. Hold on one moment. I just got to, I'll phone you back. So what actually happened is, he phoned me back and he said, yep, I'm driving home. So he's on his way to work. Now he's telling me he's driving home. He said, now go on with what you said. I said, well, you know, if you stay away two days a week, it gives me a chance to really learn how to run a branch, et cetera. Because ultimately what happens is that when you're too IC like I was there, they give you a medium-sized branch. They'll never give you a big branch like that, but you get a medium-sized branch. And I knew, I didn't tell them, I didn't want any medium-sized branch because I was going to, that was it. I wasn't going to go further than that particular branch. So cut long story short, you know, I must have had about four or five months like that. And then I had a competitor, a guy, that I used to compete against. And oh my God, we really used to compete against one another. But he was one of these type of guys that was going from working, for, leaving the one bank, going to work at the other bank. He was really chasing. And then eventually he ran out of banks and he had to go look for a job in Job. And then I saw this new job that they had advertised and I told him, and because he was looking for something, he took that. And I then joined him later. And out of that, six months later, emerged our business that him and I formed. And I was in that business until I left to come to the UK in 2001. So it's around that business and what I've been doing in the UK that I will share the entrepreneurial skills that I've acquired and people that are mentors to me have helped me with. But for me, 
him looking for something in, in Joburg, but preferably wanting to live in Cape Town, but running out of opportunities there. My boss started to get a bit disillusioned. So he was allowing me to do more and more of his job role. You know, that that you can't plan. It's just timing and elements of luck. So, you know, I always say the more effort you put in, the more luck comes your way. Well, it's like Gary Player. He said, the more he practices, the more lucky he gets. Yes. So exactly. you have to see the gap. You have to be able to see the gap and grab it. Exactly. And then you actually have to perform. Your mouth cannot be bigger than your uh, actual performance. Yeah, yeah. Well, you'll see in the next career that we went into, him and I, it was similar to what I did at the bank where you couldn't hide. You know, you had a production figure and you had to get it. You know, you couldn't be measured subjectively like he's a good manager, you know, he comes to work early. Uh, that's all irrelevant. It was, you know, you've got a target of 500,000, what you on? And, you know, you get reminded, and just like I did with my staff, you talk about that before performance almost daily yeah because that's what it's all coming about at yes, the end yes. of the day it's all about the money it's it's not greediness it's just there's certain bills to be paid and there's certain luxuries to be have and there's certain yeah, essentials yeah. and all of them cost more yeah and for those you know who know that industry very well they'll say well you know you must be good in marketing and sales to do all of that. But what I always remind people, and I learned this, I, I think I had it in me. I was almost like factory built, but I learned this from that boss that I've just spoken about, is that quality service, my gosh, it goes a long way to bring business in. And I'm not just talking about quality service, about arriving on time and things like that. It would be like, for example, when we used to have events for our dealers, we had like a, a box with cards in it. And each card was just three things. What is his hobby or her hobby? What's their pref drink, preference drink, and what's their second drink? And these cards would be allocated to the staff, and they would learn it. And when a guy comes in, they're not doing it in a plastic way or an unauthentic way. It would be, oh, how are you, Quirs? Oh, who are you? Now, I'm Mary. And then she, later on, she'll say, um, did you watch the Grand Prix? <laughs> and he goes, well, this is my sport. And then she'll say, can I get you a drink? You know, you're a Scotch man or do you like a beer? Well, he likes both. Little things like that. And then, you know, from my military days where I was quite disciplined in terms of things being orderly, we used to have big function at Carlani, you know, for the racing guys and all that, 100, 200 people. I used to run it. I used to run it on behalf of all the, the branches. I used to run it like a military operation. We'd never run out of ice. There wouldn't be too much foam in the draft set we point. The fires will be always enough coals. The, the meat wouldn't burn. There'll always be toilet paper in the, in the, in the toilets, like military precision. <laughs> and some guys didn't like it. And I should say to them, well, if you don't like it, piss off. I'll get other people to help me. Yeah, it's either right or wrong. I mean, there's nothing wrong with such an attitude in life. Yeah, because these are our guests. These are the guys that give us, or women, that give us the business every day. So what I'm going to do is when they come here, they're going to get an ex experience where they say, wow, that was fantastic. Yeah, because, of course, they go to more than one bank. And yeah, exactly. They don't get good service from you. I definitely but we'll move it. Yes, down, yep, we'll yep. cut you off. And service also where you're taking care of them, where they go, geez, this guy is really going out of his way. It's yeah. all about relationship building. So you once again you need to know your client. Yeah, very much so. You know, someone who's taught me like so go on. No, I was just saying, because something might go wrong in life, and if you know your client, you can walk up and say, look, I'm sorry, we screwed up on my car. We will yeah. definitely not happen again. And But if you have a hate relationship with that client, it's over. It's gone. Yeah. And you know, the one, this warrant officer that was a, 
a detective at the police station where I worked. I'll never forget one day he said to me, he's obviously speaking of Afrikaans. He said, you know, when you line the questions up, Kevin, and you interrogate him, house breaking, motor vehicle theft, whatever it is, he said, you're patient with your first couple of questions to build up trust and confidence. But he said, you know where you're leading with the questions, and it's the fourth and fifth question that's going to work for you. He said, it's almost like playing chess one move at a time. And then later on in life, I realized something too, that when you're marketing your brand, your company, your product and that, people always say, well, the best way to get a connection with a client is that when it comes to your product, enter the conversation that's going on in that person's mind. Don't worry about anything else. So in other words, if he's... It's about cars into the conversation that's gaining that person's mind. And that is something that will intellectually and emotionally resonate more with that client. And that's something I will cover in depth in the videos to come. Also for the eight mindsets, I've actually got an electronic scorecard. So you can measure yourself on the eight mindsets as to where you are and where you'd like to be. So basically, just for, for, for the, the listeners, I mean, after the 3-2 thing, it was the West Bank where I learned finance and insurance. Then we had a finance and insurance business in South Africa, came over here, had the same thing. And now um, I'm invested in a startup tech firm where we're developing software, marketing software, for consultants, but you'll be able to see everything there on my LinkedIn profile. Yes, I'll definitely put the link in for us. But Kevin, thank you so much. I know we're going to see you for at least another eight episodes, probably. Yes. More. As I said, that um, it's going to be live at some stage as well, so people can just follow it. And uh, thank you. I really think this is needed. I once read a report. I was a young attorney in 98, I think, 99. And some of these was great consulting companies, Anderson Consulting. I asked the question, who is that most at risk? The guy who's been liquidated, meaning he's gone bankrupt, or the sequestrated robber, or the guy who just gets a package from a government. And a lot of people got a package from a government in those years. And it came out that the guy who's gone through the malls was being uh, sequestrated much less of a risk of a guy who's just worked eight, eight to five for yes. 30 years, got his big package. Normally those guys lose their money within five years. Yes. I'm sad to say because the sharks go to them, they do trusting. Um, guys come there with a Bible under the arm. I mean, I even wrote a book about it on how they did it. And so we need these skills. And I want to urge everyone listening here, follow the program. If you follow the program, you will have better insight and you will understand more and you'll be able to protect yourself and you'll be able to make a living. It's very important. So, to yep. everyone here, Kevin, and thank you. Thank you to uh, all It's a people. pleasure. It's a uh, pleasure. Your, your people are always welcome here. Remember it. I always say that. Until we meet again, God bless.